The threat of global warming means that developed nations now need to act decisively to reduce the carbon footprint of their economies. Low and zero carbon technologies in homes, in cities and at national level are a key part of the long-term solution to climate change. In this video, we'll look at initiatives in London that promise a cleaner, more sustainable energy supply. And we'll consider the potential for realising a zero carbon future. The world's cities are responsible for 70% of the, the world's CO2 emissions. They are most at risk from climate change. They're the ones causing climate change and they're the ones best placed to tackle climate change. What climate change does is give us a really big wake-up call that means that we should really get real about renewable energy and sustainable energy policy in this country and, and let's uh, understand the scale of action we need now. London consumes as much energy annually as Greece. If the city can radically reduce its carbon emissions, it will set an example for urban environments across the world. As one of the world's leading cities, people note what we do here in the capital. Um, and if London is able to show that it's possible to have a low carbon or even a zero carbon future, then other cities around the world and indeed maybe governments will, will recognise that this isn't a fantasy, this is possible, it's possible to have a successful economy, a vibrant city and yet be low carbon. Some projects have already illustrated possible ways forward to a sustainable energy future. The Beddington Zero Energy Development, or BEDZ, in the London borough of Sutton, is designed to produce at least as much energy from renewable sources as it consumes. In Woking, near London, the borough council has reduced its CO2 emissions by 77% since 1990, using renewables, combined heat and power generation, and its own private distribution network. Alan Jones, who pioneered the scheme, is now working to implement similar plans on a much larger scale in London as part of the Mayor's strategy. Woking came to the eye of the Mayor um, and he included the, uh, the setting up of a, or an establishment of a climate change agency for London in his 2004 election manifesto. And I was appointed by the Mayor towards the end of 2004 and uh, I suppose in loose terms we, we, we refer to this as doing a Woking in London. The, the primary aims of the London Climate Change Agency is to re reduce carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent uh, emissions uh, in London. We want to uh, long term make London self-sufficient. So as part of what we're doing, we're, we're, we're looking to the future and future proofing the types of technologies that we, we want to put in or are putting in. The London Climate Change Agency aims to demonstrate that climate friendly solutions can be commercially viable through providing locally produced energy services. We established our London Climate Change Agency for two reasons. One, because we wanted to demonstrate to the private sector that delivering decentralised energy was both efficient and economic and indeed that the private sector could make a profit out of it. And secondly, because we just feel it's that it, providing decentralised energy in London is simply going to be the most efficient way of, of, of providing heat and power for London's future. It's been absolutely critical to, to the success of the agency that we've formed a commercial partnership with EDF Energy. And the fact that they have taken a serious, sort of hard-headed business look at the, the prospects for um, an energy um, company based on decentralised energy in London and decided that it is a going concern, I think really sends a very strong message to the rest of the market. The London Energy Services Company, or ESCO, has been established as a public-private joint venture between the London Climate Change Agency and EDF Energy. The London ESCO project I think is exciting in its own right and certainly it's an innovative approach that the Mayor of London has initiated. So we've taken the significant number of projects in the pipeline, about 40 or so, and we've prioritised those on the basis of determining which will have the greatest impact towards carbon reductions. Part of EDF Energy's generation portfolio is the Barkentine Heat and Power Company an efficient energy generating plant located right in the heart of a housing estate in Tower Hamlets. Barkentine project is a local combined heat and power project. It's got a district heating scheme which enables us to use the surplus heat from the electricity generation process to serve in this case about 500 local residences. One of the key benefits of this process is that it gives the 
end consumers uh, a net carbon reduction of about two tonnes per resident. So it has a benefit in CO2 terms by using this waste heat from the process. Within the Mayor's energy plan for London, uh, it's a requirement for developers and others with infrastructure to look at the opportunity for CHP applications where this waste heat can be used and we can have an overall more efficient generation process. And through this new requirement, there's a real demand in the marketplace now for this type of CHP and district heating scheme. London's infrastructure has to think about uh, the efficiency of energy really from the top to the bottom. 80% uh, of London's carbon footprint comes from buildings, so therefore buildings need to be a real hot spot. One of the London Climate Change Agency's objectives is to make its own buildings as energy efficient as possible, and it's already implementing measures which should set a precedent for the rest of London. The Palestra here, which is the new home of the London Development Agency and London Climate Change Agency, we have a combined photovoltaic roof and building integrated wind turbine system. That's a classic example of the many thousands of roofs that we have in London where that sort of technology could be put wide scale right across London. The project that we've just let or just in the process of letting as a contract is a photovoltaic roof at City Hall. It's an ideal flagship project and the works will be starting on site very shortly. Strategic planning measures have been introduced to try to ensure that new buildings in London are designed and constructed in the most sustainable way. The developers that get in now and build a, up a reputation for being able to deliver low and zero carbon developments are going to do extremely well in the coming years. Those that, that don't recognise that that's the way that the market's going are going to get rapidly left behind. The only new developments that are going to happen in London where the Mayor has any power over them are going to be low and zero carbon developments. We are simply not going to allow anything else to be built in London of any scale. It's now widely recognised that integrating renewable technologies into the urban environment can play an important role in reducing carbon emissions. In terms of UK attitudes uh, towards renewables, we have seen maybe the last year uh, a real change in, in public awareness of climate change and I think that has engendered a, uh, an increased interest in renewable energy. And when you've got David Cameron saying that he's going to put a wind turbine on, on his house, it suddenly means that renewable energy has become mainstream, normal topic of converse, conversation. That's an important change that's happened over, I think, about the last 12 months. The Mayor's goals for renewable technologies set challenging targets for planners and developers. Through the Mayor's planning powers, we've set targets for, for renewable energy use um, in all new developments in London. Currently, um, developers are required, after having um, installed the highest level of energy efficient building design and then having used decentralised energy combined heat power and cooling wherever possible. After that they are required that 10% uh, of a, a development's energy use comes from renewable sources. We're currently consulting on a revision to that strategy that would require the level to be pushed up to 20%. A number of groundbreaking projects are setting the standard for a sustainable energy future in London. Dagenham is home to London's first major wind park. These turbines generate enough energy to power 1,200 homes. In the future, there is, a, there is a number of offshore wind farms going through the planning stage. One of those will be the largest um, uh, wind farm in the world at 1,000 megawatts, which is about equal to a you know, quarter of London's energy demand. If, if we think about it, there's more energy that falls on this planet and on London every half hour equal to the total world's energy consumption annually. That just shows you how much renewable resources out there. Transport for London hopes to acquire 20% of its electricity from renewables and has encouraged the use of solar power by investing in photovoltaic installations such as this one at Vauxhall Cross Interchange. We're also trialling lots of um, new clean fuel technologies. The, the most uh, obvious one is our, our wonderful fuel cell buses, of which we have three, which simply emit steam, look like a kind of, I don't, sort of almost like a steam train as they, they go around London, but it's just pure water vapour that's coming out of the top. In addition to the free hydrogen buses that we have running around London at the moment, we're in the process of procuring another 70 vehicles, which needs to be run off hydrogen. Plans are being developed to introduce hydrogen into the transport infrastructure on a large scale. 
hydrogen can be uh, captured from renewable energy like wind and solar, but by far the biggest element will be from waste. We need to tackle waste in any event. It's regarded as a problem to be got rid of in landfill or incineration, but we're looking at it as a resource. And we've set up a number of agencies to actually capture this market so that we can work with private waste contractors and make proper use of the waste in addition to the recycling, but what do we do with the residual waste? We can convert that into a form of renewable gas that we can use as a common energy carrier. Public perceptions also need to be addressed to encourage changes in individuals' attitudes and behaviour that will help reduce carbon emissions. Public perception has been um, totally central to changing government's attitudes around the world to, to climate change. It's in, incredible in our own polling. 95% of Londoners recognise that climate change is a problem and it ranks as one of, the, one of the four or five things that they're most concerned about. By putting sustainable development at the heart of policy, London intends to become a key player in the new technologies and services that will be at the heart of a sustainable future economy. In doing so, it could play a decisive role in setting an example for the rest of the world to follow. I think a zero carbon future is entirely realisable. I think we should be able to move towards a situation where all of our energy needs are met through renewable energy technologies. We, we've done the maths. It's, it's, it's well established that there's enough natural resource out there to meet our energy needs many times over. The issue here, in the end, is whether I think we are prepared to put the resource behind it and whether we are also prepared to address the changes to our lifestyles that will be necessary so, so that we're not profligate in our use of energy. A zero carbon future is the only future that we can try and build because if we don't try and have a zero carbon future then we're going to be living on a planet that's very difficult for, for large numbers of the current human population to survive in and we have to recognize that a zero carbon future is a, is a positive future it's not something where we're going to have to reduce quality of life standard of living for people it's one where people's quality of life will improve Thank you.